eighteen, Miss Murray was to emerge from the quiet obscurity of the schoolroom into the full blaze of the fashionable world, as much of it, at least, as could be had out of London, for her papa could not be persuaded to leave his rural pleasures and pursuits even for a few weeks' residence in town. She was to make her debut on the third of January at a magnificent ball, which her mamma proposed to give to all the nobility and choice gentry of O, and its neighborhood for twenty miles round. Of course, she looked forward to it with the wildest impatience and the most extravagant anticipations of delight. Miss Gray said she one evening, a month before the all-important day, as I was perusing a long and extremely interesting letter of my sister's, which I had just glanced at in the morning to see that it contained no very bad news, and kept till now unable before to find a quiet moment for reading it. Miss Gray, do put away that dull, stupid letter and listen to me. I'm sure my talk must be far more amusing than that. She seated herself on the low stool at my feet, and I, suppressing a sigh of vexation, began to fold up the epistle. You should tell the good people at home not to bore you with such long letters," said she. "And above all, do bid them write on proper note paper and not on those great vulgar sheets. You should see the charming little lady-like notes Mamma writes to her friends." The good people at home replied, "I know very well that the longer their letters are, the better I like them. I should be very sorry to receive a charming little lady-like note from any of them. And I thought you were too much of a lady yourself, Miss Murray, to talk about the vulgarity of writing on a large sheet of paper." Well, I only said it to tease you, but now I want to talk about the ball and to tell you that you positively must put off your holidays till it is over. Why so? I shall not be present at the ball. No, but you will see the rooms decked out before it begins, and hear the music, and above all, see me in my splendid new dress. I shall be so charming; you'll be ready to worship me. You really must stay. I should like to see you very much, but I shall have many opportunities of seeing you equally charming on the occasion of some of the numberless balls and parties that are to be, and I cannot disappoint my friends by postponing my return so long. Oh, never mind your friends! Tell them we won't let you go. But to say the truth, it would be a disappointment to myself. I long to see them as much as they to see me, perhaps more. Well, but it is such a short time, nearly a fortnight by my computation, and besides, I cannot bear the thoughts of a Christmas spent from home. And moreover, my sister is going to be married. Is she? When? Not till next month. But I want to be there to assist her in making preparations and to make the best of her company while we have her. Why didn't you tell me before? I've only got the news in this letter, which you stigmatize as dull and stupid, and won't let me read. To whom is she to be married? To Mr. Richardson, the vicar of a neighboring parish. Is he rich? No, only comfortable. Is he handsome? No, only decent. Young? No, only middling. Oh mercy! What a wretch! What sort of a house is it? A quiet little vicarage with an ivy-clad porch, an old-fashioned garden, and oh, stop! You'll make me sick. How can she bear it? I expect she'll not only be able to bear it, but to be very happy. You did not ask me if Mr. Richardson were a good, wise, or amiable man. I could have answered yes to all these questions, at least so Mary thinks, and I hope she will not find herself mistaken. But miserable creature! How can she think of spending her life there, cooped up with that nasty old man, and no hope of change? He is not old; he is only six or seven and thirty, and she herself is twenty-eight, and as sober as if she were fifty. Oh, that's better then. They're well matched. But do they call him the worthy vicar? I don't know, but if they do, I believe he merits the epithet. Mercy! How shocking! And will she wear a white apron and make pies and puddings? I don't know about the white apron, but I dare say she will make pies and puddings now and then. But that will be no great hardship, as she has done it before.
And will she go about in a plain shawl and a large straw bonnet, carrying tracts and bone soup to her husband's poor parishioners? I'm not clear about that, but I dare say she will do her best to make them comfortable in body and mind, in accordance with our mother's example. End of chapter. Chapter nine, the ball. Now, Miss Gray exclaimed, "Miss Murray!" Immediately I entered the schoolroom after having taken off my outdoor garments upon returning from my four weeks' recreation. Now shut the door and sit down, and I'll tell you all about the ball. No, damn it, no! Shouted Miss Matilda. Hold your tongue, can't ye? And let me tell her about my new mare. Such a splendor, Miss Gray! A fine blood mare. Do be quiet, Matilda, and let me tell my news first. No, no, Rosalie, you'll be such a damned long time over it. She shall hear me first. I'll be hanged if she doesn't. I'm sorry to hear, Miss Matilda, that you've not got rid of that shocking habit yet. Well, I can't help it, but I'll never say a wicked word again if you'll only listen to me and tell Rosalie to hold her confounded tongue. Rosalie remonstrated, and I thought I should have been torn in pieces between them. But Miss Matilda, having the loudest voice, her sister at length gave in and suffered her to tell her story first. So I was doomed to hear a long account of her splendid mare, its breeding and pedigree, its paces, its action, its spirit, etc., and of her own amazing skill and courage in riding it. Concluding with an assertion that she could clear a five-barred gate like winking, that Papa said she might hunt the next time the hounds met, and Mama had. Ordered a bright scarlet hunting habit for her. Oh, Matilda, what stories you are telling! Exclaimed her sister. Well, answered she, no whit abashed. I know I could clear a five-barred gate if I tried, and Papa will say I may hunt, and Mamma will order the habit when I ask it. Well, now get along," replied Miss Murray, "and do, dear Matilda, try to be a little more ladylike. Miss Gray, I wish you would tell her not to use such shocking words. She will call her horse a mare. It is so inconceivably shocking, and then she uses such dreadful expressions in describing it. She must have learned it from the grooms. It nearly puts me into fits when she begins. I heard it from Papa, you ass, and his jolly friends," said the young lady, vigorously cracking a hunting whip which she habitually carried in her hand. "I'm as good judge of horse flesh as the best of 'em." Well, now get along, you shocking girl! I really shall take a fit if you go on in such a way. And now, Miss Gray, attend to me. I'm going to tell you about the ball. You must be dying to hear about it, I know. Oh, such a ball! You never saw or heard or read or dreamt of anything like it in all your life. The decorations, the entertainment, the supper, the music were indescribable. And then the guests. There were two noblemen, three baronets, and five titled ladies, and other ladies and gentlemen innumerable. The ladies, of course, were of no consequence to me, except to put me in a good humor with myself by showing how ugly and awkward most of them were. And the best, Mama told me, the most transcendent beauties among them were nothing to me. As for me, Miss Gray, I'm so sorry you didn't see me. I was charming, wasn't I, Matilda? Middling. No, but I really was. At least so Mama said, and Brown and Williamson. Brown said she was sure no gentleman could set eyes on me without falling in love that minute, and so I may be allowed to be a little vain. I know you think me a shocking, conceited, frivolous girl, but then you know I don't attribute it all to my personal attractions. I give some praise to the hairdresser and some to my exquisitely lovely dress. You must. See it tomorrow, white gauze over pink satin, and so sweetly made, and a necklace and bracelet of beautiful large pearls. I have no doubt you looked very charming, but should that delight you so very much? Oh no, not that alone. But then I was so much admired, and I made so many conquests in that one night. You'd be astonished to hear. But what good will they do you? What good? Think of any woman asking that. 
Well, I should think one conquest would be enough, and too much, unless the subjugation were mutual. Oh, but you know I never agree with you on those points. Now wait a bit, and I'll tell you my principal admirers, those who made themselves very conspicuous that night and after, for I've been to two parties since. Unfortunately, the two noblemen, Lord G and Lord F, were married, or I might have condescended to be particularly gracious to them. As it was, I did not. Though Lord F, who hates his wife, was evidently much struck with me, he asked me to dance with him twice. He is a charming dancer, by the by, and so am I. You can't think how well I did. I was astonished at myself. My lord was very complimentary too, rather too much so, in fact, and I thought proper to be a little haughty and repellent. But I had the pleasure of seeing his nasty, cross wife ready to perish with spite and vexation. Oh, Miss Murray, you don't mean to say that such a thing could really give you pleasure, however cross or well. I know it's very wrong, but never mind. I mean to be good some time. Only don't preach now. There's a good creature. I haven't told you half yet. Let me see. Oh, I was going to tell you how many unmistakable admirers I had. Sir Thomas Ashby was one. Sir Hugh Meltham and Sir Broadley Wilson are old codgers, only fit companions for Papa and Mama. Sir Thomas is young, rich, and gay, but an ugly beast, nevertheless. However, Mama says I should not mind that after a few months' acquaintance. Then there was Henry Meltham, Sir Hugh's younger son, rather good-looking and a pleasant fellow to flirt with. But being a younger son, that is all he is good for. Then there was young Mr. Green, rich enough but of no family, and a great stupid fellow, a mere country booby. And then our good rector, Mr. Hatfield, an humble admirer, he ought to consider himself. But I fear he has forgotten to number humility among his stock of Christian virtues. Was Mr. Hatfield at the ball? Yes, to be sure. Did you think he was too good to go? I thought he might consider it unclerical. By no means, he did not profane his cloth by dancing, but it was with difficulty he could refrain. Poor man, he looked as if he were dying to ask my hand just for one set. And oh, by the by, he's got a new curate. That seedy old fellow, Mister Bly, has got his long wished for living at last, and is gone. And what is the new one like? Oh, such a beast! Weston, his name is. I can give you his description in three words: an insensate, ugly, stupid blockhead. That's four, but no matter. Enough of him now. Then she returned to the ball and gave me a further account of her deportment there, and at the several parties she had since attended, and further particulars respecting Sir Thomas Ashby and Messrs. Meltham, Green, and Hatfield, and the ineffaceable impression she had wrought up on each of them. Well, which of the four do you like best? Said I, suppressing my third or fourth yawn. I detest them all," replied she, shaking her bright ringlets in vivacious scorn. That means, I suppose, I like them all. But which most? No, I really detest them all. But Harry Meltham is the handsomest and most amusing, and Mr. Hatfield the cleverest, Sir Thomas the wickedest, and Mr. Green the most stupid. But the one I'm to have, I suppose, if I'm doomed to have any of them, is Sir Thomas Ashby. Surely not, if he's so wicked, and if you dislike him. Oh, I don't mind his being wicked. He's all the better for that. And as for disliking him, I shouldn't greatly object to being Lady Ashby of Ashby Park if I must marry. But if I could be always young, I would be always single. I should like to enjoy myself thoroughly and coquette with all the world till I am on the verge of being called an old maid, and then to escape the infamy of that after having made ten thousand conquests to break all their hearts save one by marrying some high-born, rich, indulgent husband, whom, on the other hand, fifty ladies were dying to have. Well, as long as you entertain these views, keep single by all means and never marry at all. 
not even to escape the infamy of old maidenhood. End of chapter. Chapter 10. The Church. Well, Miss Gray, what do you think of the new curate? asked Miss Murray on our return from church the Sunday after the recommencement of our duties. I can scarcely tell, was my reply. I have not even heard him preach. Well, but you saw him, didn't you? Yes, but I cannot pretend to judge of a man's character by a single cursory glance at his face. But isn't he ugly? He did not strike me as being particularly so. I don't dislike that cast of countenance. But the only thing I particularly noticed about him was his style of reading, which appeared to me good, infinitely better, at least, than Mr. Hatfield's. He read the lessons as if he were bent on giving full effect to every passage. It seemed as if the most careless person could not have helped attending, nor the most ignorant have failed to understand, and the prayers he read as if he were not reading at all, but praying earnestly and sincerely from his own heart. Oh, yes, that's all he is good for. He can plod through the service well enough, but he has not a single idea beyond it. How do you know? Oh, I know perfectly well. I am an excellent judge in such matters. Did you see how he went out of church, stumping along, as if there were nobody there but himself, never looking to the right hand or the left, and evidently thinking of nothing but just getting out of the church, and perhaps home to his dinner, his great stupid head could contain no other idea. I suppose you would have had him cast a glance into the squire's pew, said I, laughing at the vehemence of her hostility. Indeed, I should have been highly indignant if he had dared to do such a thing, replied she, haughtily tossing her head. Then, after a moment's reflection, she added, Well, well, I suppose he's good enough for his place, but I'm glad I'm not dependent on him for amusement, that's all. Did you see how Mr. Hatfield hurried out to get a bow from me? and be in time to put us into the carriage? Yes, answered I, internally adding, and I thought it somewhat derogatory to his dignity as a clergyman to come flying from the pulpit in such eager haste to shake hands with the squire and hand his wife and daughters into their carriage, and moreover I owe him a grudge for nearly shutting me out of it, for in fact, though I was standing before his face, close beside the carriage steps, waiting to get in, he would persist in putting them up and closing the door till one of the family stopped him by calling out that the governess was not in yet. Then, without a word of apology, he departed, wishing them good morning, and leaving the footman to finish the business. Note to Benny, Mr. Hatfield never spoke to me, neither did Sid Hugh or Lady Meltham, nor Mr. Harry or Miss Meltham, nor Mr. Green or his sisters, nor any other lady or gentleman who frequented that church, nor, in fact, any one that visited at Horton Lodge. Miss Murray ordered the carriage again in the afternoon for herself and her sister. She said it was too cold for them to enjoy themselves in the garden, and besides, she believed Harry Meltham would be at church. For, said she, smiling slyly at her own fair image in the glass, he has been a most exemplary attendant at church these last few Sundays. You would think he was quite a good Christian. And you may go with us, Miss Gray. I want you to see him. He is so greatly impressed. Proved since he returned from abroad, you can't think. And besides, then you will have an opportunity of seeing the beautiful Mr. Weston again, and of hearing him preach. I did hear him preach, and was decidedly pleased with the evangelical truth of his doctrine, as well as the earnest simplicity of his manner, and the clearness and force of his style. It was truly refreshing to hear such a sermon after being so long accustomed to the dry, prosy discourses of the former curate and the still less edifying harangues of the rector. Mr. Hatfield would come sailing up the aisle, or rather sweeping along like a whirlwind, with his rich silk gown flying behind him and rustling against the pew doors, mount the pulpit like a conqueror ascending his triumphal car, then sinking on the velvet cushion in an attitude of studied grace, remain in silent prostration for a certain time, then mutter 
over a collect and gabble through the Lord's Prayer, rise, draw off one bright lavender glove to give the congregation the benefit of his sparkling rings, lightly pass his fingers through his well-curled hair, flourish a cambric handkerchief, recite a very short passage, or perhaps a mere phrase of scripture as a headpiece to his discourse, and finally deliver a composition which as a composition might be considered good, though far too studied and too artificial to be pleasing to me, the propositions were well laid down, the arguments logically conducted, and yet it was sometimes hard to listen quietly throughout without some slight demonstrations of disapproval or impatience. His favorite subjects were church discipline, rites and ceremonies, apostolical succession, the duty of reverence and obedience to the clergy, the atrocious criminality of dissent, the absolute necessity of observing all the forms of godliness, the reprehensible presumption of individuals who attempted to think for themselves in matters connected with religion or to be guided by their own interpretation of scripture, and occasionally to please his wealthy parishioners, the necessity of deferential obedience from the poor to the rich, supporting his maxims and exhortations throughout with quotations from the fathers, with whom he appeared to be far better acquainted than with the apostles and evangelists, and whose importance he seemed to consider at least equal to theirs. But now and then he gave us a sermon of a different order, what some would call a very good one, but sunless and severe, representing the deity as a terrible taskmaster rather than a benevolent father. Yet, as I listened, I felt inclined to think the man was sincere in all he said. He must have changed his views and become decidedly religious, gloomy and austere, yet still devout. But such illusions were usually dissipated on coming out of church by hearing his voice in jocund colloquy with some of the Melthams or Greens or perhaps the Murrays themselves, probably laughing at his own sermon and hoping that he had given the rascally people something to think about, perchance exulting in the thought that old Betty Holmes would now lay aside the sinful indulgence of her pipe, which had been her daily solace for upwards of thirty years, that George Higgins would be frightened out of his Sabbath evening walks, and Thomas Jackson would be sorely troubled in his conscience and shaken in his sure and certain hope of a joyful resurrection at the last day. Thus, I could not but conclude that Mr. Hatfield was one of those who bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them upon men's shoulders while they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, and who make the word of God of none effect by their traditions, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men." I was well pleased to observe that the new curate resembled him, as far as I could see, in none of these particulars. "'Well, Miss Gray, what do you think of him now?' said Miss Murray, as we took our places in the carriage after service. "'No harm still,' replied I. "'No harm?' repeated she in amazement. "'What do you mean?' "'I mean, I think no worse of them than I did before.' "'No worse? I should think not, indeed. Quite the contrary. Is he not greatly improved?' "'Oh, yes, very much indeed,' replied I, for I had now discovered that it was Harry Meltham she meant, not Mr. Weston. That gentleman had eagerly come forward to speak to the young ladies, a thing he would hardly have ventured to do had their mother been present. He had likewise politely handed them into the carriage. He had not attempted to shut me out, like Mr. Hatfield, neither, of course, had he offered me his assistance. I should not have accepted it if he had, but as long as the door remained open, he had stood smirking and chatting with them, and then lifted his hat and departed to his own abode. But I had scarcely noticed him all the time. My companions, however, had been more observant, and as we rolled along, they discussed between them not only his looks, words, and actions, but every feature of his face and every article of his apparel. "'You shan't have him all to yourself, Rosalie,' said Miss Matilda at the close of this discussion. "'I like him. I know he'd make a nice, jolly companion for me.' 
Well, you're quite welcome to him, Matilda, replied her sister, in a tone of affected indifference. And I'm sure, continued the other, he admires me quite as much as he does you, doesn't he, Miss Gray? I don't know. I'm not acquainted with his sentiments. Well, but he does, though. My dear Matilda, nobody will ever admire you till you get rid of your rough, awkward manners. Oh, stuff! Harry Meltham likes such manners, and so do Papa's friends. Well, you may captivate old men and younger sons, but nobody else, I am sure, ever will take a fancy to you. I don't care. I'm not always grabbing after money like you and Mama. If my husband is able to keep a few good horses and dogs, I shall be quite satisfied, and all the rest may go to the devil. Well, if you use such shocking expressions, I'm sure no real gentleman will ever venture to come near you. Really, Miss Gray, you should not let her do so. I can't possibly prevent it, Miss Murray. And you're quite mistaken, Matilda, in supposing that Harry Meltham admires you. I assure you, he does nothing of the kind. Matilda was beginning an angry reply, but happily our journey was now at an end, and the contention was cut short by the footman opening the carriage door and letting down the steps for our descent. End of chapter. Chapter 11. The Cottagers. As I had now only one regular pupil, though she contrived to give me as much trouble as three or four ordinary ones, and though her sister still took lessons in German and drawing, I had considerably more time at my own disposal than I had ever been blessed with before, since I had taken upon me the governess's yoke, which time I devoted partly to correspondence with my friends, partly to reading, study, and the practice of music, singing, etc., partly to wandering. In the grounds or adjacent fields, with my pupils if they wanted me, alone if they did not. Often, when they had no more agreeable occupation at hand, the Misses Murray would amuse themselves with visiting the poor cottagers on their father's estate, to receive their flattering homage, or to hear the old stories or gossiping news of the garrulous old women, or perhaps to enjoy the pure pleasure of making the poor people happy with their cheering presence and their occasional gifts, so easily bestowed, so thankfully received. Sometimes I was called upon to accompany one or both the sisters in these visits, and sometimes I was desired to go alone, to fulfill some promise which they had been more ready to make than to perform, to carry some small donation, or read to one who was sick or seriously disposed, and thus I made a few acquaintances among the cottagers, and occasionally I went to see them on my own account. I generally had more satisfaction in going alone than with either of the young ladies, for they, chiefly owing to their defective education, comported themselves towards their inferiors in a manner that was highly disagreeable for me to witness. They never, in thought, exchanged places with them, and consequently had no consideration for their feelings regarding them as an order of beings entirely different from themselves. They would watch the poor creatures at their meals, making uncivil remarks about their food and their manner of eating. They would laugh at their simple notions and provincial expressions till some of them scarcely durst venture to speak. They would call the grave elderly men and women old fools and silly old blockheads to their faces, and all this without meaning to offend. I could see that the people were often hurt and annoyed by such conduct, though their fear of the grand ladies prevented them from testifying any resentment, but they never perceived it. They thought that, as these cottagers were poor and untaught, They must be stupid and brutish, and as long as they, their superiors, condescended to talk to them and to give them shillings and half crowns or articles of clothing, they had a right to amuse themselves, even at their expense, and the people must adore them as angels of light, condescending to minister to their necessities and enlighten their humble dwellings. I made many and various attempts to deliver my pupils from these delusive notions without alarming their pride, which was easily offended and not soon appeased, but with little apparent result, 
and I know not which was the more reprehensible of the two. Matilda was more rude and boisterous, but from Rosalie's womanly age and ladylike exterior, better things were expected. Yet she was as provokingly careless and inconsiderate as a giddy child of twelve. One bright day in the last week of February, I was walking in the park, enjoying the threefold luxury of solitude, a book, and pleasant weather. For Miss Matilda had set out on her daily ride, and Miss Murray was gone in the carriage with her mamma to pay some morning calls. But it struck me that I ought to leave these selfish pleasures and the park with its glorious canopy of bright blue sky, the west wind sounding through its yet leafless branches, the snow wreath still lingering in its hollows, but melting fast beneath the sun, and the graceful deer browsing on its moist herbage, already assuming the freshness and verdure of spring. And go to the cottage of one Nancy Brown, a widow whose son was at work all day in the fields, and who was afflicted with an inflammation in the eyes, which had for some time incapacitated her from reading. To her own great grief, for she was a woman of a serious, thoughtful turn of mind, I accordingly went and found her alone as usual in her little. Close, dark cottage, redolent of smoke and confined air, but as tidy and clean as she could make it. She was seated beside her little fire, consisting of a few red cinders and a bit of stick, busily knitting with a small sackcloth cushion at her feet, placed for the accommodation of her gentle friend the cat, who was seated thereon with her long tail half encircling her velvet paws, and her half-closed eyes dreamily gazing on the low crooked fender. Well, Nancy, how are you today? Why, middlin', Miss? I, my zone, my eyes is no better, but I'm a deal easier in my mind nor I have been," replied she, rising to welcome me with a contented smile, which I was glad to see, for Nancy had been somewhat afflicted with religious melancholy. I congratulated her upon the change. She agreed that it was a great blessing and expressed herself right down thankful for it. Adding, if it please God to spare my sight and make me so as I can read my Bible again, I think I shall be as happy as a queen. I hope He will, Nancy," replied I. "And meantime, I'll come and read to you now and then when I have a little time to spare." With expressions of grateful pleasure, the poor woman moved to get me a chair. But as I saved her the trouble, she busied herself with stirring the fire and adding a few more sticks to the decaying embers. And then, taking her well-used Bible from the shelf, dusted it carefully and gave it me. On my asking if there was any particular part she should like me to read, she answered. Well, Miss Gray, if it's all the same to you, I should like to hear that chapter in the first epistle of Saint John that says, "God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him." With a little searching, I found these words in the fourth chapter. When I came to the seventh verse, she interrupted me and, with needless apologies for such a liberty, desired me to read it very slowly, that she might take it all in and dwell on every word, hoping I would excuse her, as she was but a simple body. The wisest person, I replied, might think over each of these verses for an hour and be all the better for it, and I would rather read them slowly than not. Accordingly, I finished the chapter as slowly as need be, and at the same time, as impressively as I could, my auditor listened most attentively all the while and sincerely thanked me when I had done. I sat still about half a minute to give her time to reflect upon it, when, somewhat to my surprise, she broke the pause by asking me how I liked Mr. Weston. I don't know," I replied, a little startled by the suddenness of the question. I think he preaches very well. I he does so, and he talks well too. Does he? He does. Maybe you haven't seen him, not to talk to him much yet. No, I never see any one to talk to except the young ladies of the hall. Ah, they're nice, kind young ladies, but they can't talk as he does. Then he comes to see you, Nancy. He does, Miss, and I's thankful for it. He comes to see all us poor bodies a deal oftener nor Master Bly or the rector ever did, and it's well he does, for he's always welcome. 
we can't say as much for the rector. There is that says they're fair feared on him. When he comes into a house, they say he's sure to find some wrong and begin a calling him as soon as he crosses the doorstones. But maybe he thinks it his duty like to tell him what's wrong, and very oft he comes a purpose to reprove folk for not coming to church or not kneeling and standing when other folk does, or going to the Methody Chapel or summit or that sort. But I can't say at he ever found much fault with me. He came to see me once or twice afore Maister Weston come, when I was so ill troubled in my mind, and as I had only very poor health besides, I made bold to send for him, and he came right enough. I was sore distressed, Miss Gray. Thank God it's owered now. But when I took my Bible, I couldn't get no comfort of it at all. That very chapter you've just been reading troubled me as much as aught. He that loveth not knoweth not God. It seemed fearsome to me, for I felt that I loved neither God nor man as I should do and could not if I tried ever so. And the chapter of four, where it says, "He that is born of God cannot commit sin." And another place where it says, "Love is the fulfilling of the law," and many, many others, Miss. I should fare weary you out if I was to tell them all, but all seemed to condemn me and to show me that I was not in the right way. And as I knew not how to get into it, I sent our bill to beg Maister Hatfield to be as kind as look in on me some day. And when he came, I told him all my troubles. And what did he say, Nancy? Why, Miss, he seemed to scorn me. I might have been mistaken, but he like gave a sort of a whistle, and I saw a bit of a smile on his face, and he said, "Oh, it's all stuff. You've been among the Methodists, my good woman." But I told him I'd never been near the Methodies, and then he said, "Well." Says he, "You must come to church, where you'll hear the scriptures properly explained, instead of sitting poring over your Bible at home." But I told him I always used coming to church when I had my health. But this very cold winter weather, I hardly durst venture so far, and me so bad with the rheumatic and all. But he says. It'll do your rheumatiz good to hobble to church. There's nothing like exercise for the rheumatiz. You can walk about the house well enough. Why can't you walk to church? The fact is, says he, you're getting too fond of your ease. It's always easy to find excuses for shirking one's duty. But then you know, Miss Gray, it wasn't so. However, I told him I'd try. But please, sir, says I, if I do go to church. What the better shall I be? I want to have my sins blotted out, and to feel that they are remembered no more against me, and that the love of God is shed abroad in my heart. And if I can get no good by reading my Bible and saying my prayers at home, what good shall I get by going to church? The church says he is the place appointed by God for His worship. It's your duty to go there as often as you can. If you want comfort, you must seek it in the path of duty. And a deal more, he said, but I cannot remember all his fine words. However, it all came to this: that I was to come to church as oft as ever I could, and bring my prayer book with me, and read up all the sponsors after the clerk, and stand and kneel and sit and do all as I should, and take the Lord's supper at every opportunity, and hearken his sermons and master blies, and it'd be all right. If I went on doing my duty, I should get a blessing at last. But if you get no comfort that way, says he, it's all up. Then, sir, says I, should you think I'm a reprobate? Why, says he? He says, if you do your best to get to heaven and can't manage it, you must be one of those that seek to enter it at the straight gate and shall not be able. And then he asked me if I'd seen any of the ladies of the hall about that morning. So I told him where I had seen the young misses go on the moss lane, and he kicked my poor cat right across the floor and went after him as gay as a lark. But I was very sad. That last word of his fair sunk into my heart and lay there like a lump of lead till I was weary to bear it. 
However, I followed his advice. I thought he meant it all for the best, though he had a queer way with him. But you know, Miss, he's rich and young, and such like cannot right understand the thoughts of a poor old woman such as me. But howsever, I did my best to do all as he bade me. But maybe I'm plaguing you, Miss, with my chatter. Oh no, Nancy, go on and tell me all. Well, my rheumatiz got better. I know not whether with going to church or not. But one frosty Sunday, I got this cold in my eyes. The inflammation didn't come on all at once, like, but bit by bit. But I wasn't going to tell you about my eyes. I was talking about my trouble of mind, and to tell the truth, Miss Gray, I don't think it was anyways eased by coming to church, not to speak on at least. I like got my health better, but that didn't mend my soul. I hearkened and hearkened the ministers and read and read at my prayer book, but it was all like sound and brass and a tinkling cymbal. The sermons I couldn't understand, and the prayer book only served to show me how wicked I was that I could reach such good words and never be no better for it, and often feel it a sore labor and a heavy task beside instead of a blessing and a privilege as all good Christians does. It seemed like as all were barren and dark to me, and then them dreadful words: "Many shall seek to enter in and shall not be able." They like as they fair dried up my spirit. But one Sunday, when Maister Hatfield gave out about the sacrament, I noticed where he said, "If there be any of you that cannot quiet his own conscience, but requireth further comfort or counsel, let him come to me or some other discreet and learned minister of God's word and open his grief." So next Sunday morning, a fourth service, I just looked into the vestry and began a talking to the rector again. I hardly could fashion to take such a liberty, but I thought when my soul was at stake, I shouldn't stick at a trifle. But he said he hadn't time to attend to me then. And indeed, says he, I've nothing to say to you but what I've said before. Take the sacrament, of course, and go on doing your duty. And if that won't serve you, nothing will. So don't bother me any more. So then I went away, but I heard Master Weston. Master Weston was there, Miss. This was his first Sunday at Horton, you know, and he was in the vestry in his surplice, helping the rector on with his gown. Yes, Nancy, and I heard him ask Master Hatfield who I was, and he says, "Oh, she's a canting old fool," and I was very ill grieved, Miss Gray, but I went to my seat and I tried to do my duty as aforetime, but I like got no peace, and I even took the sacrament, but I felt as though I were eating and drinking to my own damnation all the time, so I went home sorely troubled. But next day, afore I'd gotten fettled up, for indeed, Miss, I'd no heart to sweeping and fettling and washing pots, so I sat me down in the muck. Who should come in but Master Weston? I started siding stuff then and sweeping and doing, and I expected he'd begin a calling me for my idle ways as Master Hatfield would have done. But I was mistaken. He only bid me good morning, like in a quiet, decent way. So I dusted him a chair and fettled up the fireplace a bit, but I hadn't forgotten the rector's words. So says I, "I wonder, sir, you should give yourself that trouble to come so far to see a canting old fool such as me." He seemed taken aback at that, but he would fain persuade me that the rector was only in jest, and when that wouldn't do, he says. Well, Nancy, you shouldn't think so much about it. Mister Hatfield was a little out of humor just then. You know we're none of us perfect. Even Moses spoke unadvisedly with his lips. But now sit down a minute, if you can spare the time, and tell me all your doubts and fears, and I'll try to remove them. So I sat me down and nipped him. He was quite a stranger, you know, Miss Gray, and even younger nor Master Hatfield, I believe. And I had thought him not so pleasant looking as him, and rather a bit crossish at first to look at. But he spake so civil like, and when the cat, poor thing, jumped onto his knee, he only stroked her and gave a bit of a smile. 
So I thought that was a good sign. For once, when she did so to the rector, he knocked her off, like as it might be in scorn and anger, poor thing. But you can't expect a cat to know manners like a Christian, you know, Miss Gray. No, of course not, Nancy. But what did Mr. Weston say then? He said not. But he listened to me as steady and patient as could be, and never a bit of scorn about him. So I went on and told him all, just as I've told you, and more too. Well, says he, Mr. Hatfield was quite right in telling you to persevere in doing your duty, but in advising you to go to church and attend to the service and so on, he didn't mean that was the whole of a Christian's duty. He only thought you might there learn what more was to be done and be led to take delight in those exercises instead of finding them a task and a burden. And if you had asked him to explain those words that trouble you so much, I think he would have told you. That if many shall seek to enter in at the straight gate and shall not be able, it is their own sins that hinder them. Just as a man with a large sack on his back might wish to pass through a narrow doorway and find it impossible to do so unless he would leave his sack behind him, but you, Nancy, I dare say, have no sins that you would not gladly throw aside if you knew how. Indeed, sir, you speak truth," said I. "Well," says he, "you know the first and great commandment, and the second, which is like unto it, on which two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You say you cannot love God, but it strikes me that if you rightly consider who and what He is, you cannot help it. He is your Father, your best friend. Every blessing, everything good." Pleasant or useful comes from him, and everything evil, everything you have reason to hate, to shun, or to fear, comes from Satan, his enemy as well as ours. And for this cause was God manifest in the flesh, that He might destroy the works of the devil. In one word, God is love. And the more of love we have within us, the nearer we are to Him, and the more of His Spirit we possess. Well, sir, I said, if I can always think on these things, I think I might well love God. But how can I love my neighbors when they vex me and be so contrary and sinful as some of them is? It may seem a hard matter, says he, to love our neighbors who have so much of what is evil about them, and whose faults so often awaken the evil that lingers within ourselves. But remember that he made them, and he loves them. And whosoever loveth him that begat, loveth him that is begotten also. And if God so loveth us that He gave His only begotten Son to die for us, we ought also to love one another. But if you cannot feel positive affection for those who do not care for you, you can at least try to do to them as you would they should do unto you. You can endeavor to pity their failings and excuse their offenses, and to do all the good you can to those about you. And if you accustom yourself to this, Nancy, the very effort itself will make you love them in some degree. To say nothing of the good will your kindness would beget in them. Though they might have little else that is good about them, if we love God and wish to serve Him, let us try to be like Him, to do His work, to labor for His glory, which is the good of man, to hasten the coming of His kingdom, which is the peace and happiness of all the world. However powerless we may seem to be in doing all the good we can through life, the humblest of us may do much towards it. And let us dwell in love, that He may dwell in us, and we in Him. The more happiness we bestow, the more we shall receive, even here, and the greater will be our reward in heaven when we rest from our labors. I believe, Miss, them is His very words, for I've thought 'em over many a time. And then He took that Bible and read bits here and there, and explained 'em as clear as the day. And it seemed like as a new light broke in on my soul, and I felt fair a glow about my heart, and only wished poor Bill and all the world could have been there and heard it all and rejoiced with me. 
After he was gone, Hannah Rogers, one of the neighbors, came in and wanted me to help her to wash. I told her I couldn't just then, for I hadn't set on the potatoes for the dinner, nor washed up the breakfast stuff yet. So then she began a calling me for my nasty idle ways. I was a little bit vexed at first, but I never said nothing wrong to her. I only told her like all in a quiet way, and I'd had the new parson to see me, but I'd get done as quick as ever. I could, and then come and help her. So then she softened down, and my heart, like as it warmed towards her, and in a bit we was very good friends. And so it is, Miss Gray. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. It isn't only in them you speak to, but in yourself. Very true, Nancy. If we could always remember it, ay, if we could. And did Mr. Weston ever come to see you again? Yes, many a time. And since my eyes had been so bad, he sat and read to me by the half hour together. But you know, Miss, he has other folks to see and other things to do. God bless him! And that next Sunday he preached such a sermon. His text was, "Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest." And them two blessed verses that follows. You wasn't there, Miss. You was with your friends then. But it made me so happy, and I am happy now, thank God. And I take a pleasure now in doing little bits of jobs for my neighbors, such as a poor old body that's half blind can do, and they take it kindly of me, just as he said. You see, Miss, I'm knitting a pair of stockings now. There for Thomas Jackson. He's a queerish old body, and we've had many about at threeping, one and then the other, and at times we've differed sorely. So I thought I couldn't do better nor knit him a pair of warm stockings, and I've felt to like him a deal better, poor old man, sin I began. It's turned out just as Maister Weston said. Well, I'm very glad to see you so happy, Nancy, and so wise. But I must go now. I shall be wanted at the hall," said I, and bidding her goodbye, I departed, promising to come again when I had time, and feeling nearly as happy as herself. At another time, I went to read to a poor labourer who was in the last stage of consumption. The young ladies had been to see him, and somehow a promise of reading had been extracted from them, but it was too much trouble, so they begged me to do it instead. I went willingly enough, and there too I was gratified with the praises of Mr. Weston, both from the sick man and his wife. The former told me that he derived great comfort and benefit from the visits of the new parson, who frequently came to see him, and was another guest sort of man to Mr. Hatfield, who, before the other's arrival at Horton, had now and then paid him a visit. On which occasions he would always insist upon having the cottage door kept open to admit the fresh air for his own convenience, without considering how it might injure the sufferer, and having opened his prayer book and. Hastily read over a part of the service for the sick would hurry away again, if he did not stay to administer some harsh rebuke to the afflicted wife, or to make some thoughtless, not to say heartless, observation, rather calculated to increase than diminish the troubles of the suffering pair. Whereas said the man, Master Weston will pray with me quite in a different fashion, and talk to me as kind as out, and oft read to me too, and sit beside me just like a brother. Just for all the world! Exclaimed his wife, and about a three weeks sin, when he seed how poor Jem shivered with cold, and what pitiful fires we kept, he axed if we're stock of coals was nearly done. I telled him it was, and we was ill set to get more. But you know, Mum, I didn't think of him helping us. But howsever, he sent us a sack of coals next day, and we've had good fires ever sin, and a great blessing it is this winter time. But that's his way, Miss Gray. When he comes into a poor body's house to see and sick folk, he like notices what they most stand in need on, and if he thinks they can't readily get it their selling, he never says no to bout it, but just gets it for 'em. And it isn't everybody at to do that, and has as little as he has. For you know, Mum, he's not at all to live on but what he gets for the rector, and that's little enough, they say. 
I remembered then, with a species of exultation, that he had frequently been styled a vulgar brute by the amiable Miss Murray because he wore a silver watch and clothes not quite so bright and fresh as Mr. Hatfield's. In returning to the lodge, I felt very happy and thanked God that I had now something to think about, something to dwell on as a relief from the weary monotony, the lonely drudgery of my present life, for I was lonely. Never from month to month, from year to year, except during my brief intervals of rest at home, did I see one creature to whom I could open my heart or freely speak my thoughts with any hope of sympathy or even comprehension. Never one, unless it were poor Nancy Brown, with whom I could enjoy a single moment of real social intercourse, or whose conversation was calculated to render me better, wiser, or happier than before. Or who, as far as I could see, could be greatly benefited by mine. My only companions had been unamiable children and ignorant, wrong headed girls, from whose fatiguing folly unbroken solitude was often a relief most earnestly desired and dearly prized. But to be restricted to such associates was a serious evil, both in its immediate effects and the consequences that were likely to ensue. Never a new idea or stirring thought came to me from without, and such as rose within me were, for the most part, miserably crushed at once, or doomed to sicken or fade away, because they could not see the light. Habitual associates are known to exercise a great influence over each other's minds and manners. Those whose actions are forever before our eyes, whose words are ever in our ears, will naturally lead us, albeit against our will, slowly, gradually, imperceptibly perhaps, to act and speak as they do. I will not presume to say how far this irresistible power of assimilation extends, but if one civilized man were doomed to pass a dozen years amid a race of an intractable savages, unless he had power to improve them, I greatly question whether, at the close of that period, he would not have become at least a barbarian himself. And I, as I could not make my young companions better, feared exceedingly that they would make me worse, would gradually bring my feelings, habits, capacities to the level of their own, without, however, imparting to me their light heartedness and cheerful vivacity. Already I seemed to feel my intellect deteriorating, my heart petrifying. My soul contracting, and I trembled lest my very moral perceptions should become deadened, my distinctions of right and wrong confounded, and all my better faculties be sunk at last beneath the baneful influence of such a mode of life. The gross vapors of earth were gathering around me and closing in upon my inward heaven, and thus it was that Mr. Weston rose at length upon me, appearing like the morning star in my horizon to save me from the fear of utter darkness, and I rejoiced that I had now a subject for contemplation that was above me, not beneath. I was glad to see that all the world was not made up of Bloomfields, Murrays, Hatfields, Ashbys, etc., and that human excellence was not a mere dream of the imagination. When we hear a little good and no harm of a person, it is easy and pleasant to imagine more. In short, it is needless to analyze all my thoughts, but Sunday was now become a day of peculiar delight to me. I was now almost broken in to the back corner in the carriage, for I liked to hear him, and I liked to see him too, though I knew he was not handsome, or even what is called agreeable in outward aspect, but certainly he was not ugly. In stature, he was a little. A very little above the middle size, the outline of his face would be pronounced too square for beauty, but to me it announced decision of character. His dark brown hair was not carefully curled like Mr. Hatfield's, but simply brushed aside over a broad white forehead. The eyebrows, I suppose, were too projecting, but from under those dark brows there gleamed an eye of singular power, 
brown in color, not large, and somewhat deep set, but strikingly brilliant and full of expression. There was character too in the mouth, something that bespoke a man of firm purpose and an habitual thinker. And when he smiled, but I will not speak of that yet, for at the time I mention I had never seen him smile, and indeed his general appearance did not impress me with the idea of a man given to such a relaxation, nor of such an individual as the cottagers described him. I had early formed my opinion of him, and in spite of Miss Murray's objurgations, was fully convinced that he was a man of strong sense, firm faith, and ardent piety. But thoughtful and stern, and when I found that to his other good qualities was added that of true benevolence and gentle, considerate kindness, the discovery perhaps delighted me the more, as I had not been prepared to expect it. End of chapter.